So hey, Snegda, welcome to the Naked Arab podcast. I hope you're doing well. And yes, tell me all about yourself, uh, your, you know, what subjects you're doing in high school and then, you know, your research with Stanford. Um, just, yeah, go off. <laughs> oh, uh, I guess it's probably useful for people to know that uh, I'm not uh, among the typical people that uh, our Sanjana hosts. Um, I'm just a lowly high school student. Uh, and I'm from New York, um, but I wasn't born here. I was, uh, I was, I immigrated to India with my family, immigrated from India uh, to America with my family when I was around two, three years old um, in pursuit of a better life like everybody else. Um, and uh, I grew up on uh, Long Island, New York for most of my life. And I'm still here. Uh, it is in the middle of nowhere and it's not worth going here, um, but uh, I found a totally new world when uh, my parents gifted me a computer when I was 15. Um, before that, I actually did not grow up with the internet and I did not realize how abnormal that was uh, because uh, I didn't know life with the internet growing up without one. Um, and most of my generation has grown up with iPads and computers and everything, but I didn't actually. And I think that has what made me, I think, a little bit different than some of my peers. Um, that has definitely contributed to it. Um, and uh, ever since I got a computer, uh, I've been fascinated by computers and how machines work uh, and if we can make machines think, uh, which I still don't know. It's just a piece of sand, you know. Um, and uh, since then, I've been uh, more deeply interested in pursuing my uh, already uh, interests, which were mathematics and computation and uh, understanding how we work. Oh, and I do research uh, at uh, Stanford. Um, there's an NLP lab. I'm an independent researcher. I'm not like uh, working for them, but uh, I'm working with a PhD candidate, uh, Dorcha Demsky, and we're trying to understand how um, our emotions have changed throughout the pandemic with language models. Wow, that's brilliant. Um, so in terms of uh, natural language processing, right? Um, so at, at the moment, like uh, with the um, knowledge that I have about deep narrow AI, like speech recognition, you know, image and all that stuff. Um, what do you think about uh, the current state of natural language processing? And, um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, with the whole na core narrative and emotions, what has that been like in terms of research? Um, so basically we're just essentially using like a sentiment analysis to um, understand how uh, the social data sets have trended over time since COVID has started uh, from the moment that the COVID was heard about to uh, vaccine distribution. Uh, we have been just uh, cleaning data and uh, trying to understand like what the uh, commonalities and trends are uh, within certain demographics. Uh, throughout COVID, um, throughout the pandemic rather. Um, and it's just sentiment analysis, so I don't think it's anything particularly special. I just chose to do research because I wanted to uh, repair a part of myself that I feel like I've lost, which is uh, deep thinking and uh, patience. I feel like the internet has actually taken a little bit of patience away from me. And uh, I thought that research would help me rebuild that, and it, it has been. So I was correct. Yeah, that's good to know. So, um, yeah, in terms of your research with Stanford and then your curiosity in general, I saw your website, which is too cool, by the way. It's really oh, well designed. It's um, so childish. I have to get it minimal. No, but it's so cool because like I was, um, I was swiping through it and it's like, yeah, I'm interested in this, and you can find me here, and like it's it's just very thoroughly designed. Um, I wish I had a website <laughs> like that. Um, so again, yeah, in terms of um, AI and natural language processing and, and everything, you know, technological evolution, if you want, if you want to say that, um, I feel like in terms of human evolution in general, um, you know, we have come way too far um, as humans, as Homo sapiens, um, as intellectual and intelligent sapiens, I must say. Um, what do you think about? Um, the current state of human evolution, like where are we at the moment? And what do you think would be, you know, us going 
even more further than you know what we are at the moment um i think i saw something that i will steal from lex friedman and he said something along the lines of um we used to be like tigers and now we are cats uh and that is like the best way i can think of in terms of how we've evolved um i think we've made very interesting things and very complex systems uh but maybe you've over complicated them as well um but mostly i think a lot of us uh a lot of us that have grown up on the internet and um a lot of us that have been delivered things conveniently for them um i think we are a little bit removed from reality at its core um and because we are so removed from reality from its, at its core uh it's hard to know uh what made us tough because uh human beings are millions of miracles we are a result of millions and millions of beautiful miracles uh throughout uh like hundreds of years um and we're not even that old we're actually super young compared to how old the universe is um and uh given that we've been made through so many miracles um uh, i have a hard time uh relating to sometimes people that uh don't understand their value of such a precious human life um and um i relate i mean i understand where they're coming from but i don't relate to it myself um but there was a point when i did relate to them where i did not understand my own value and i did not think i mattered so it's okay we've all been depressed <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, since we have been uh, so far removed from what has made us wonderful and us and uh, here, um, I, I think that we've become cats and we need to become tigers again. Yeah, no, I totally, I, the cat anal, an, an analogy, geez, uh, it's, it's too good. Um, and and you're, you're completely right. Like when I look at human evolution, it's like, um, you know, we were, you know, it, in terms of Darwinian evolution, like we were there and now we're here and now it seems like we're moving towards some sort of a tech infused human evolution. You know, you said that we're so um, we're so away from reality at the moment, you know, and I think it's um, like from my perspective, it seems like, you know, because we, we have technology and, you know, phones and everything um it seems like you know we're downloading our consciousness into this um and everything that we do is has been stored into this and now where we go from here to let's say transhumanism or you know neuralink stuff um it seems like you know we'll be tech in a few cyborgs and like at some point um and that would be kind of interesting that that would be very interesting to see and like um i mean there's of course dangers to that because like at you know like you know you know to me it seems like you know as humans we want to make our life so comfortable that you know to an extent that you know we don't even want to move um so if yeah. we were to look at like some sort of like very um far futuristic person you know from a far futuristic perspective we have all of these technology doing everything for us so what happens to our physical bodies then you know i mean yeah yeah like it's already we are using all of this you know like already it seems like this is a part of our life so i mean it's crazy it's crazy there's like advantages and there's disadvantages so what do you think about like i mean advantages are good what do you think about the disadvantages i think that would be a, you, yeah i was going to tell you something um I'm in my class um, and there are people that are around me that are about like 16 to 18 years old. None of them are 18 yet, but um, essentially like what I realized is all of them don't know how to tell time. <laughs> like there is nobody that knows how to tell time on an analog clock like, like this. Like, no, like, do you see how this is analog? Like nobody can tell time. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. That is something that is so fundamental to understanding um, like, I guess, like the nature of uh, how we create life, like everything is on time and uh, it all relates to aging and how we see ourselves and how we see other people and how we see our future. It has all to do with it. I'm so surprised, but people will rather resort to a digital clock. And uh, while it is OK to understand conveniences, I think uh, I think like it does, it removes us from thinking deeper and uh, understanding rudimentary ways of how the world is working. And understanding something very simple as like uh, an analog clock, 
uh, is uh, something that I'm afraid I actually don't think most people in my generation know how to do. Um, maybe there'll, there'll be surveys out that prove me wrong, and that could be true. Um, but from what I'm seeing, it feels like it's super far removed. Another example is like calculators. Of course, that was very necessary given um, the large numbers of, that we have calculated uh, to get here. But uh, some of my classmates don't know how to do basic arithmetic. Um, and that's a very rudimentary way of uh, calculating and computing. So I figure most people should know it, but actually like a lot of them have forgot, like, like long division, like, <laughs> like this is, I mean, I see the reason why school exists. Um, it teaches us the rudimentary ways of how things work and then we apply them as we get older. So like, I actually don't hate school. Uh, it teaches us important things, whether we realize it now or whether we realize it later. Oh no, I completely agree there. Um, you know, now that we have smart watches and everything, yeah. it seems like no one cares about time anymore. You know, it's like heartbeat yeah. and God knows what all stuff you have there, picking up calls and it, it's, it's crazy. Um, and also like we have calculators and advanced calculators. Who wants to go and like grab a pen and paper and just like start doing yeah. all of these arithmetic stuff when we have all of these technology doing everything for us? But you're very right about um, high, like school, middle school, high school. Um, I mean, I, I did my school here in India, so mm. it was way girls. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we were taught like maths and science and social sciences, like it was everything up till I think, um, up till I think eighth grade. And then, um, you know, ninth and 10th, you know, you're mostly choosing subjects. So, you know, you go into humanities more and all of oh, that. That's so stuff. cool. Yeah, but um, yeah, and, and the best part about all of it was that we really got to learn, you know, all of these amazing things. And um, I fear that in future, um, in future of academy or future of ed education, whether, you know, students would be able to have the same rigorous understanding of what subjects are. Um, and it's it's disheartening, but at the same time, I'm kind of optimistic. I hope they, um, you know, make amazing academic modules and everything for students that, you know, it, it, one thing that's happening in uh, India at the moment, which is very um, new, is that they're making, um, you know how we uh, in India have this thing that you have to choose uh, physics, chemistry, bio, like it's like a thing, like, you know, when you go into 11th and 12th grade, it's like a package thing. So, you know, physics, chemistry, bio, then you can choose maths, like, you know, then if you go in humanities, like history, particle science, psychology, then another thing. And now, you know, students can opt for, let's say, history, physics, um, you know, what, like they can jumble with it, they can play with it. So whatever suits them best, they can do it. And that way, I feel like, you know, you're engineering, um, you know, amazing students because they are genuinely interested in these subjects. They, like if I were to take physics, chemistry and biology, I'm not interested in chemistry. I can just remove chemistry and, you know, put political science or, you know, psychology or something like that and like play with it. Um, so in, yeah. in that terms, I feel like I'm really happy about what the academy has been doing here in India. And I, I don't know what so they had earlier. Though. That's so cool. So in India, they specialize earlier. You know, wow, I should I should know a little bit about the Indian education system, given that I'm from there, but I actually have no idea. Um, maybe maybe I, maybe I don't have to know, but uh, I do want to know. Um, in, uh, in the US, I don't think it is this way. Although there are certain schools uh, that do specialize. Uh, it's not the normal public school, but there are some rare schools that uh, I've seen in like the really, I guess the wealthier parts uh, of the country where they're in New York City, there's like a Brooklyn Technical High School. Um, I don't go there, but um, essentially like they specialize earlier where they're like hardware courses and software courses and uh, control systems courses and differential equations. Like they teach things earlier. Um, they get you very, very prepared for college. Um, so like, I do understand the benefits of those. In fact, I kind of wish I went to school like that. Um, but I, I've been going to like a very lowly public school for most of my life. And then, uh, I jumped around and, uh, now I'm going to, uh, a Christian school, but
but it's just for my last year of high school and wrapping it up. It's been cool. Wow, what's the distinction? Uh, so you know how in um Hollywood movies and everything they depict this public school and this private school and all all of that stuff in the Western world. Like, how would you differentiate that? Like, uh, because like from a popular you know culture of you, you just see you know private schools are for you know quote unquote rich kids. You know they have uniforms and whatnot. And then I um, well, we do have uniforms. That is true. So how's Christian school like? Actually, I think it's it's pretty cool. Um, I actually um, chose it with my parents. Uh, that's my last year of high school. I was like not sure what to do, and I wanted to do school in person, and I didn't want to go back to my old public school. And so my parents uh, they uh, enrolled me in this the Christian school, and I was like, yeah, actually, like I would like to go there. I would be curious to know what these people are like. Uh, because okay okay it's not like I'm observing a specimen but like uh, actually that is kind of what I'm doing whatever it's the mind of a scientist right um, and uh, essentially like I was just like I haven't really grown up with people that sincerely believe in the Christian faith uh, in the fullest capacity um, in fact my parents weren't even like super Hindu themselves they uh, they tried but they drove me to atheism very early um, and uh, given that uh, I've been trying to find my own uh, sense of God and my own sense of purpose for the past like year or so. Um, and uh, I'm just exploring and uh, taking a little bit from each religion and trying to understand what is useful for me um, that will help me as a whole uh, spiritually. So uh, Christian school has been very cool actually. Um, I was surprised, uh, but they're actually very open-minded people. And I actually feel very safe with the Christians to talk about my random ideas uh, because they will listen to me. <laughs> Whether they understand it or not, it doesn't matter. It's like they get it, right? They, they're just listening to me, no doubt. I'm at the lunch table and this nice Christian girl is next to me. And I'm just like, wow, did you see what he said about da -da -da, like something in class? And he's, she's like, yeah, so I got the homework assignment and everything. I'm like, yeah, but did you see that and that and that and that and that? And I will like go on about something and she will have no idea what I'm talking about, but she listens and she's nice, okay? That's all that matters. Uh, I noticed the Christian people are sincerely caring. Like they're actually very, very kind people, at least from my minimal experience. Um, and uh, there seems to be like, at least in the school that I go to, like a true sincerity and devotion. Um, I think they also explain, so the school that I go to uh, is from a Lutheran standpoint. Uh, have you heard of Ma Martin Luther? And not Martin oh. Luther King Jr., but I'm talking about the one from 1517. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had... Okay, cool. So uh, the, the church, uh, I guess the sector of the church, they started uh, Lutheran uh, Christianity. That's where my church is, uh, my school church is based out of. And basically like it has a more, rational take i think on christianity uh, where uh there are reasons behind why things are as they are actually my pastor the pastor at the school i asked him like hey i would love to like uh like know a why to believe in something uh so like when you are trying to uh you try to incentivize a new christian or a curious christian what do you do you have to have good reasons to bring them in right so actually he gifted me this book it's called Luther's Small Catechism with Explanations. And that's the really awesome thing. Um, this book has uh, explanations uh, of like uh, different parts of the Bible and prayer and how they work and why they are for the reasons that they are. It's so cool. I haven't finished reading this, but I'm working my way through it. Um, and yeah, it's been a very interesting experience. I understand the value of Christianity. I know why it matters. And our, in fact, our country in the US was based out of Christianity. Um, so. There's a lot of good there, I think. No oh, religion is perfect, though, so full disclosure, no religion is perfect. Oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> um, I mean, um, so from first standard, uh, first standard up till fifth, um, I, was in a, I was in a Christian school as well here um, oh, in India. Okay. Um, and it was based around St. Assisi, um, something like that. Now I've forgotten all of these things, but, um, you know, things are coming back. And, you know, we would have, um, you know, they, they weren't like, you know, um, unrationalistic, if that's a term, um, you know, they were open, hard sciences were very much appreciated, but yes. they also had, you know, these um, classes or 
um, you know, around uh, religious studies or, you know, prayers, you have to do prayers, you know, yeah. um, so every day in the morning, there's like, yes. um, there's like Let's one do. hour of, you know, just like you, you all uh -huh. are standing in an assembly and everyone's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that we was very really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have a daily prayer at our school. Yeah, and it's 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 such a concept, right? Um, and I grew up, uh, you know, my parents super religious, so it, like in a very religious environment, but like very multi -religious, uh, religious environment because my dad's very much into theology and everything, and so uh, is my mom. Um, and uh, you know, so Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, um, Islam, like everything. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of have a whole, because if you grow up like that, you listen, it's like, you know, you kind of know. What about um, Asianism? <laughs> yeah, and, um, <laughs> um, and <laughs> and it's just so good. Oh. And, and, <laughs> and, um, and like, so yeah, I had like a good understanding of, you know, where they were coming from. Although now I'm an atheist um, and everything, but um, cool. it's it's good to it's good to know where your roots um, come from, even if you know it's religious in nature. Um, I learned a lot about Christianity through the Christian school. Um, then um, a lot from my home, you know, about Hinduism and like J Judaism and all of these things. And I would often like go to my um, sister or you know whatever you want to call it, like sister, like in the sense like she was. The she was a principal, but she was also like a, you know, a nun. Um, oh, a nun. Oh, interesting. And so, you know, I, I would often go to her and be like, hey, so there's a King James version of um, Psalm 20, 23. Um, and, wow, you remember. <laughs> yeah, and, and because here in, uh, in Judaism too, it's like a whole thing. And yeah. so I was like, you know, what are the roots of that? Because like we do have that in, um, Judaism we have but King James version is more like the Christian version and so I would often ask her you know what's you know what's happening here you know why is it's the same thing but like why how much um, Jewish influence um, does Christianity have because like out of Judaism came Christianity um, and so she would often like tell me you know all of these theological way you know theology has evolved um, you know from that era like from 14th century before enlightenment now and you know what the trajectory has been it's very interesting it's always been very interesting to dive into that um but like i think coming to some another subject <laughs> um now we have a lot of um conversations going around gender right like it's it's such a common topic at the moment you have pronouns you know there's gender neutral people whatnot um, what are your opinions on that like as a growing up person like and especially in high school and everything now that it's so popularized um, like in university I did not get to see that much um, but I feel like because you're growing up there I think you might be seeing it even more so you know what, what do you think about all that um, I think I think that I respect people that are sincere um, and uh, it's I think it's, I think I'm, I think it's an easier time uh, respecting somebody that doesn't make, uh, like, that doesn't make a part of themselves, their entire personality. Or uh, I guess like, I don't know, I don't go around saying, hello, I'm a woman, I'm a woman, I'm a woman, I'm a woman, trust me, I'm a woman, I love doing things as a woman, I'm eating as a woman, trust me, I'm a woman. I don't say these things. Um, and uh, if you are uh, what you are, uh, just be it. Um, that's fine. Uh, it's important that you're true to yourself uh, in the best capacity that you can be. But uh, if you are imposing it on other people and uh, you're attacking their autonomy, that is no good. Um, because, you know, for any other reason, uh, we are human beings and uh, we all deserve to think freely. Um, and um, I think that people should be respectful of how we each want to express ourselves, uh, but also know the limits of uh, how far our consequences can sometimes go. Like, I guess, I guess uh, how far our actions can go to lead to certain consequences. Um, 
I try not to think how it will go on a scalar level because um, it's not really my place uh, to tell people how to act or how not to act. Um, uh, it is my place to stop something if someone is hurting me or uh, like attacking my autonomy. I'll be like, hello, stop this. <laughs> Uh, that's not okay. Uh, but uh, at least uh, in the West, it seems to be increasingly common where people are self-censoring. Um, this is why I was kind of referring to earlier, like I feel safer expressing my random ideas and my questions to people in the Christian community because they're actually a lot more open to listening to me than uh, most of the liberals that I know. Um, I feel like I have to really refrain and stop myself from asking questions um, that are sincere and not meant to hurt anybody. Um, you know, and uh, they will give me credit and be okay with it because I'm a kid. But what happens when I'm not a kid? Like, I still am going to be curious, right? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose that. But uh, I still want to be able to ask questions without people thinking, oh, she's a kid, so I'll let her do it. No, it's I'm a human being, and I should be able to ask questions on how things work. And as long as I'm not saying it disrespectfully to hurt anybody, and I don't have any malintent, it should be okay. Um, but everything is seen as offensive, and uh, that's kind of scary. Like a world where everyone is uh, thinking everything is offensive. Uh, there is something that I read um, that uh, from uh, the Temptations of Tyranny, there is uh, there's a little bit of a piece that someone wrote uh, from the Republic. Uh, and they said that uh, Plato described how in democratic societies, the uh, insatiable desire for freedom prepares the ground for tyranny. And the more free people become, the more they resent the limitations on that freedom and condemn the always insufficient progress already made as oppression. Um, and as hierarchies collapse and order breaks down, people lose structure and meaning. The parent fears the child, the old fear the young, and a tyranny of silence suffocates free speech as citizens self-censor out of fear that their views may be seen as disagreeable or despotic. But it's in this climate that tyrant emerges with the promise that he alone can deliver uh, unlimited freedom and the people willingly fall into the embrace of unlimited despotism. So uh, given this, um, I'm a little bit fearful of how we might be heading um, as, a, as a society if we are not careful and uh, we impose our overexpressiveness onto other people. I think that uh, no matter who we are, we should be respectful of our autonomy and uh, give each other the space to be free and say what we please without hurting others. But uh, we shouldn't be, uh, considering everything offensive though, because uh, not everything is so high stakes. And when you make everything super high stakes, um, everything loses value and meaning. No, that's a correct way to think. Um, and I like the Plato's reference there because I feel like, you know, the Republic definitely, even though Very it's um, Greek philosophy, um, it has definitely shaped a lot of um, democratic society that we have at the moment. Um, and also about, you know, free speech and whatnot. There's so many debates around it. Free will yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Free will. <laughs> That's a different demon. <laughs> you get into it, next thing you're cancelled. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you can't, you can't talk about free will. Yeah. It's just so, it's it's crazy. Um, and then, you Lisa know. Harris, Lisa well. Harris can talk about free will. Yeah, that's that's him, you know, and, and we're we're good. <laughs> um, but like when it comes to autonomy on the internet, right? Um, uh, you must have heard how they um, banned Donald Trump from you know uh, Twitter and everything. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so you know, I was thinking about it, you know, from both perspectives, you know, the right, the left, whatever you want to call it. Um, for me, it seemed um, unreasonable to do that in the sense that. It, seem, it seems to me now, now that, you know, how we have given power to the government, but now it seems like we're giving power to the tech companies um, mm. to do whatever they want in terms of free speech. Um, yeah. So, you know, of course, um, doing something like getting Donald Trump off would mean that there would be other platforms that would be created where, you know, all of the right people would start to do whatever yeah. they want. Um, yeah. And, and it's kind of bad, like in the sense that um, we should allow free speech on the internet and no one on Twitter should be able to do that because, you know, we're essentially giving power to the tech companies now. Um, yeah, yeah. I have a little bit of a thought on that. Um, 
there was some sort of scenario and um, I don't know all of the details, but on Facebook, somebody had a post um, where it was like related to COVID um, and they were sharing opinions, yada, yada. Um, Facebook took it down, uh, despite the fact that it did not violate their rules of conduct. Um, but there were just a lot of people that were complaining from another side um, on the opinion and Facebook took it down. Um, I don't know the specifics of this, but uh, essentially it made me think like, what can uh, these, what should, I guess, these people take down and what shouldn't they? And um, <clears throat> I thought um, social media is basically an extension of who we are as human beings. Um, what social media does is it just offers uh, open channels and more markets that makes it more accessible for anybody to say whatever they want. They can uh, broadcast whatever they'd like, but uh, we've always done that, but we've done it in person, right? Uh, we would gather in uh, public town centers and we would screech on the top of our lungs with uh, bullhorns and uh, we would gather crowds. Um, this is what we would do. Uh, but now it's like, it's just more accessible, but it, it's not that it didn't exist. So how do you distinguish, uh, given this sort of shift, what to take down and what not to take down? And my thoughts are pretty simple. It's like, if it's not illegal, don't take it down. That's very simple, but uh, it's the, I guess our uh, larger structures are buckling down uh, at the site of uh, greater discourse. Like the greater there is a sort of pain uh, and uh, the louder the voices are, the harder it is for uh, a company to not buckle down and take something down or I guess keep it up even. Uh, regardless of its legal or illegal status. So um, yeah, my thinking is this, if it's illegal, then take it down. It, that should, that's no question. If it's not illegal, then don't take it down because it's just an extension of who we are and what we have already done. I know, completely, completely relate on that. And like one thing that comes to my mind at the moment is how YouTube works and how YouTube, you know, how they censor a lot of stuff. Um, I guess a popular popular culture example would be um you know how there's a lot there's a lot of youtubers on, uh, on here and if you talk about covid they take uh, they take away your um monetization completely and especially around vaccines so if you um if me as a youtuber goes ahead on a podcast whatever and talks about covid vaccines or the lab leak hypothesis or you know all of this stuff yeah. um youtube would just strike down the monetization no monetization on that one yeah. um and again it's it's you know limiting free speech and you know free thought and like dialogue and you know speculation curiosity um because they're i mean these things need to be talked about like we have everything to talk about these things. Yeah. it's it's crazy like another example would be um you know how there's so much nudity and whatnot on the um oh gosh and, and it's crazy how like large creators, so let's say Kanye and all of these people can uh, post, you know, videos like the famous, um, but that wouldn't be taken down. But, um, you know, there's um, another YouTubers and they're, you know, they're doing all of these things with like, picking up women and whatnot. It's like, a, a part, you know, um, and that would be taken down. So I'm just like, you know, what's happening here? Are we giving power to um, the celebrities to do everything they can and you know not striking them down but when it comes to ordinary people it's like you know they're canceling them out it's it's also something i keep on wondering you know what's happening there yeah i think i think our world has gone a little bit away not a little bit a lot uh, uh a lot further away from um speaking with rationality and uh i don't mean rationality in the religious sense but uh i mean it in the more uh like logical thinking and uh, well-backed reasoning sense. And uh, it's gone away from that. And it's moreover, um, how loud are the masses? How loud are the voices that the people decide, quote unquote. But it's not always representative of the people. It is just whoever is screaming fire the loudest. OK, gosh, I don't mean to say that that way. But it's like whoever is holding the pitchfork and is holding the biggest pitchfork. It's really about that. Uh, less than who is speaking with the voice of reason. Um, and I don't know what to do uh, in a world like that. We need to go back from that uh, because we are making choices that uh, are not uh, upholding the constitution.
uh, we're not acting with integrity. Sorry, the constitution is the, you know, uh, but the lot basically what the US is based off of. Oh, no, completely. Like, um, I mean, definitely, I feel like this era, even though there's rationalism, I feel like we're moving off of that. Um, and especially on the internet, like it's, it's off. Like I see tweets and like whatnot, and they're just like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, what's your source, you know? Um, yeah. You know, popular example is, you know, how um, you can um, subscribe to like all of these. Um, so, you know, I, I subscribe to the psychology and all of these other tabs. So they would sure. show you, you know, um, and oftentimes the psychology would be like, oh, you know, psychology says this, 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 this. And I would always like, you know, tweet them out, like reply to that too. Like, what's your source? Where mm. is this coming from? You know, mm. why does psychology say, like, did Freud say it? Did Lacan say it? Like, who said this? You know, like, who said this? Like, well, what's your yeah. source? No one is um, providing your source, but they're just, like, speaking of, you know, whatever they think psychology is saying. Whatever they think, yeah. It's, it's really the best, the best way, I think, to mitigate the sort of solution, I think, is uh, to just look up the answer yourself to whatever they're talking about. Just look it up yourself. Uh, find your own research, uh, find your own reasoning, and then come back with it. Be like, hello, here's what I presented. Uh, what do you think of this? See, it's more interesting when you're not like just questioning them because they're like, oh, I can go away from that. But when you provide a uh, counterpoint uh, that is well-backed, that's when you'll get more attention and people will be on your side when you're correct. Yeah, completely. Like, um, you know, like, but another thing uh, is that like, if I go on, like, the tweet is of psychology says blah 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 um you know it's also about you you can reply to them you know what's your source but no one's gonna reply no to care. that because like you yeah. know like it's um so you know I, I i hate the fact that so many people like it and so many people retweet it because they actually think it's, it's reactionary it. yeah and and how do we even stop that like you know how do we make yeah. these people aware of sources citations and all of that stuff that you have to do if you're claiming yeah. something i don't know what's going to happen with that one i don't um, either so how would you differentiate between normies and nerds what's your definition of normies as a <gasps> <to nerds>? uh <laughs> i don't have any concrete definition for them uh but i think about it a lot um and they're just a bunch of feelings that are like worrying in my head uh, without having any concrete crown because there are thousands of normies that will say, hey, I'm a nerd. Why did you keep me out of this? And then there are a bunch of nerds who are like, oh, well, there are going to be fewer nerds because apparently now being a nerd is cool. Um, there are going to be a bunch of nerds who are like, wait, what do you mean I was a normie? I thought the entire time, what is this? So it's, it's very difficult for me personally to create a definition right now, but uh, Mainly, I think when I think of a nerd, I just think of somebody who, um, I think I think of somebody who um, is very deeply obsessed with certain something, um, and I try not to um, limit it to like science or math because it's more than that. Um, there are plenty of nerds that are interested in philosophy, plenty of nerds interested in politics, and not the kind of politics that is going on in the modern day, but more like. Uh, political history. Uh, there's plenty of history nerds out there. Um, I think of nerds as just people who are sincerely obsessed and devoted to something and often are shunned in the beginning for that obsessive interest. Um, this is true for many. Um, and uh, often find that they were actually uh, right to believe in themselves and their interests all along. Um, they just didn't know that when they were younger. Um, I don't know, that's a typical story of a nerd. But that's something I think of. And also uh, one of my friends mentioned to me once that uh, nerds probably, sorry, normies probably think of nerds the way that nerds think of normies. Like, oh, they're both so weird. <laughs> uh, like they're both outcasts, so. Yeah, I don't know what a normie is. Like I have no clue. <laughs> like whenever I go on the internet, like what is a normie? Like every, every day there's a new term coming out and I'm just like, what? Like, what does that even mean, you know? Um, yeah. I think I'm a nerd <laughs> and I'm proud to be a nerd you know I, I think same goes for you at some point like to some extent um, and and I hate the fact that um, non-nerdy people 
you know use nerd as like some sort like seems like an insult but you're like hey like hey i'm just a nerd yeah it's a it's a it's a short term intro uh insult it's a lot like how um uh th- okay i might be politically hated for this but like there is uh there's like a wide variety of people who will hate on um like interracial sorry uh like interracial marriage wait am i using interracial the right word like different races marrying into each other okay yes okay uh there are a lot of people that will hate on that um but what they do that's a very like short term reaction um the long term result is that the child is now uh uh well adjusted to so many different biological factors it is an easier time finding diseases and harder time getting sick so like it's a very like short term reaction to a long term benefit um and uh that's like one of the ways that i thought about it today um but same thing as like people will hate on nerds uh in the beginning with like oh you're so weird in school whatever uh but then the nerd is the one that ends up being their boss you know and that's kind of what i really like about uh silicon valley honestly because it's just a bunch of uh kids who were uh, uh just like pulled hairs uh and were stuffed in lockers um hopefully none of this is actually true but it was just a bunch of kids that were extremely traumatized and then come together and are like hello let's join our own group <laughs> and they end up ruling the world <laughs> um and honestly i'm supportive of that sort of uh uh brotherhood oh yeah no me too completely like <laughs> it's it's crazy because i don't think many people talk about this like you really? know and yeah yeah like you know like I go on the internet that people are like making threads or whatever, but then I don't think it's a popularized um, topic of discussion, which is like, why not? Um, okay, um, maybe moving towards feminism now, <laughs> right? Um, so like, so, you know, back in the, I would say late 19th century, um, you know, there was this philosopher, women philosopher, um, her name was Simone de Beauvoir. French, um, and she had this revolutionary book called The Second Sex, and, you know, she described how, you know, women have been suppressed with all of these male ideals of what women should be, and, you know, how women should be liberated, like, everything has been structured by men um, and not women, so she wrote this book, you know, and the sections of it about women's sexuality, women liberation, you know, just, um, and it was one of the most revolutionary books because no, you know, no philosopher had done that before. Um, and to me, it was, it was a really good influence um, understanding, you know, what femini- feminism was like back in the day. And now, you know, now, now, now it's more, um, thankfully, thankfully, you know, people understand feminism more. But then again, there's feminism and then there's feminazi, right? Um, mm-hmm. which is like you know like I often wonder like I, I often wonder where if feminazi is this term used by men to you know depreciate the movement of feminism you know so if something happens to a man you know they're like oh yeah the chick is uh, feminazi and um, and I'm just like like you know, oh, why sure. have a word like femina- like feminazi? Like, you know, why have a word like that? You know, it's, it's too crazy. Um, so, um, you know, I guess the question would be, what do you think about the way, you know, feminism has, you know, what's the evolution of feminism? Oh, gosh. Um, I think I tried to see everybody as human being. Um, that's like my first and foremost rule, like uh, on a very personal level. Uh, although I don't know how, how uh, it scales for society and uh, whether that's truly good for women or whether women tell themselves it's really good for them, even if it's not. Um, I think uh, actually I was um, taking this uh, test earlier and there was a passage uh, that talked about, um, talked about feminism as it was like first starting in England. Um, and uh, essentially what was happening is there was a, there in the passage, uh, there was this woman that was saying like, you know, uh, there are men that are graduating and going into like administrator jobs and med practicing medicine and everything. Um, and uh, we have that choice now too. Uh, what will you do? Because the moment is, is it's, it's a momentous moment uh, and time is going very fast. 
you have to make a decision. What will you do? Uh, because uh, what we do will affect everything. Uh, because uh, obviously it's the world has changed a lot since women have taken jobs uh, in the market. And um, I think I think it's there's a scale. I think about a lot of uh, extremes and balances on a scale where it starts off with like uh, nothing. It starts off with nothing, an extreme nothing. And then it approaches a balanced something. And then it becomes an extreme something. Um, and uh, in my mind, uh, essentially what I've realized is like uh, feminism was extreme nothing where like women didn't, were not able to own property. They weren't able to get jobs or educated. And it was an extreme nothing. And I think on some level, it was like disrespecting uh, humanity. Uh, and then we had been approaching a balanced something uh, where we have substance of like, hey, let's actually let women take jobs and let's not discriminate against them because they're a woman. Uh, they should, it should just be competence-based, right? Uh, like as if we should treat all human beings. Um, and um, I agree with that. And that was a very balanced and good way. Uh, and now we're, I think we're kind of approaching an extreme something where like the something that we was, which was feminism, uh, it's, it's going a little bit extreme in the sense where now it is not like whether or not uh, you are good enough for the role, but it's more about, hey, are you a woman or a man? Um, and in some places um, they actually prefer men. So they will favor men over women regardless, but uh, with the affirmative action movement since the seventies, uh, in the US at least. Um, now it is like, hey, we will take you more because you are a woman than a man. And I think it's becoming, it's becoming like a bit of an extreme overbalance. Um, and it was, I don't know, we have to go back to the way that things were in a balanced way, not the way that it was an extreme where women were not allowed to do anything. No, I don't recommend that. Um, women have done extremely awesome things for society right um and we want to keep it that way but we don't want women to feel like there's a lot of people that will tell like um oh did i just get the job because i was a girl did i just get the job because like they need diversity um and that's happening more in the modern world uh than in the uh i guess like the unmodern worlds but um given that it's hard to know what is true for the woman. She's like, am I truly competent enough for the job? Is my skill level on parallel to everybody else's or like on the same level? Um, or is it because I'm a woman? And she shouldn't have to question herself. She should know that, hey, I'm meant for this job. I'm actually really competent and I'm out here for it. She should, she should know that. Um, and he should also feel that, hey, I didn't get the job because I wasn't good enough, not because she was a girl and she got. He should also feel that way. Um, and, uh, I think because we are approaching a bit of an extreme, it's hard to know. Um, and this also kind of relates to the tyranny point that I was kind of making earlier, where like, if I kind of said this to, I guess, someone outside of your crowd of people that are viewing this, um, I would might even, I might be canceled. Um, even though I try to uh, articulate things in a way uh, where I'm speaking sincerely in a, in a, I guess in a balanced way that takes both perspectives. Um, I still might be canceled for it. So I'd try to be safe, um, right? Uh, so I think that's what I would say when it comes to like jobs on a global scale. Um, with feminism and in the sexual empowerment, um, I am a little bit worried. Uh, I don't know if the current world that we live in is the one that I'd want my children to grow up in. Um, and uh, to be honest, uh, like there's always existed um, women, uh, you know, showing their nakedness for um, like material gain. Like this is, this has happened before, but there are um, more more channels for that. There is a greater access for that given the internet. Um, and I fear in a world where this is so, so normal. Uh, instead it was rare before the internet. It was, it was a lot, uh, prostitution was a lot rarer. Um, now it's a lot more common and even some women want to grow up and become that. Um, those are actually called influencers, actually. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I fear that given that this might be a norm, um, I don't know if this is the type of world I want my children to grow up in. I would love a wholesome world uh, where children and family are kind of the center of how people see things and are, uh, you know, they're a little bit modest. But that might be the growing Christian part of me speaking. 
No, I like how your thought articulation is so fast. Um, I, I like it because um, I rarely see that in high school students. <laughs> yeah um it's it's quite fast i love that um uh, um yeah like i often think about you know this entire um feminine issues within workplace or even school and whatnot like am i intelligent enough am i is my intellectual you know standard high or are you just hiring me because i'm a woman and you're required to ha- hire women or stuff stuff like that yeah and even you know even being like I mean, I never say I'm a philosopher or an intellectual. I always say that I philosophize and I intellectualize because I'm still on, in the process of becoming that. And that's probably going to happen when I'm 40 or whatever. Um, and like, you know, I often wonder, you know, even when I get podcast people on and stuff like that, you know, I wonder, are they coming on my podcast to listen to my curiosity or intelligence or is it because I'm a woman, you know, like all of that, like, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's 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 something that I often think about and it's quite distressing but at the same time don't care because like <laughs> you start thinking too much yeah. about it then it's like a rabbit hole of going down that lane um and, and it's crazy thing. how much um how much femininity on internet is on is on like it's so distressing because like you go on Instagram you have filters right and so now mm-hmm. If I, you know, if I were to go on and like Instagram, I can, you know, make my face this way, but that way, you know, like, and all the notes, you know, all that kind of stuff. And do I want my kids growing up not loving their, you know, their body as it is? Um, yeah. Or, you know, just uh, what do you call it? Photoshopping and all of this stuff. It's, it's actually yeah. very, very distressing um, because, you know, like, and also another thing, you know, I see on the internet is that people tend to post the highlights of their life. So it seems yeah. like, you know, as, as a normal kid, as a normal person, you go through these stories and you're like, wow, this person is like really living their life as compared to me, I'm doing nothing. You know, like if you're, if you're actually doing nothing or in a depressive phase, you're like, damn, I wish my life was like that. And what I hate about it is that people are insecure about sharing the bad moments of their life. I think there should be a balance between that because if you're sharing good moments, you should also be sharing bad moments. You should not feel like, oh, people are gonna judge me. People are gonna think that I'm going crazy and like you know, attention seeking, whatever. I think you know there should be a fair balance of that because if there's a fair balance of that, um, kids or people on the internet they're gonna feel like, okay, I'm human, you know, and I'm supposed to feel good and I'm also supposed to feel bad. And if I'm portraying all of this on the internet, then both of this should be on the internet. So you know, we are filtering um filtering out all of these you know um notions where women or men or whatever um they're trying to you know show how they show themselves on the internet so it's more filter less um so that's something to also think about um it also worries me a lot i think you can go into a little bit of an extreme sometimes uh and this is a thing that i little i fear about um there is a movement uh, in where people are rationalizing their failures publicly. Um, And it can, so like, again, the whole scale thing where it's like an extreme of like, hey, I'm living my life to the best and like, it's amazing. Um, And that's all you see to like, okay, now you see that the person is human to now like, hey, all I'm sharing is the pain that I go through. Everybody, please uh, come in my corner and save me. And that extreme uh, extreme something uh, in this case, uh, which is rationalization of your failure publicly uh, is something to be wary about. Um, And also with regards to social media, um, I think people should have the behavior uh, that whatever they want, uh, whatever relationship that they want with social media. Um, It's uh, it's a different thing um, than having relationships with people in real life. Um, See, the truth is like we tell our people that we feel closest to or uh, that we feel safe with um, like the good, the good things and the bad things, and that is fine. We have actually no obligation to share uh, either of the good or the bad out in public in social media, um, because it is just it is just like a public town center, but just uh, on one channel, um, and so and it's on a digital channel. And so I think people should choose whatever relationship they want with it, um, regardless of however anyone else chooses a relationship with it. 
um, because people will be people. They will post good things, they'll post bad things. It just matters of how you perceive it yourself. Um, and if you have a healthy relationship where it's helping you, social media is helping you more than hurting you, then you're doing something right. Um, and if you're having a relationship with it where you are always beating yourself down because of how people are being, rather than inspiring yourself to become the best version of yourself, uh, then I think you have a bad relationship with it and you should, you should reconsider. No, I totally agree. There should be homeostasis in this degree, right? Um, yeah. Like if, yeah, you're completely right about the extremes because there's always polar extremes, like, you know, how you see happy motivational accounts and then there's uh, so sad today, you know? Um, there should be, you know, homeostasis there. Like, you know, if um, you're portraying good sides, bad sides, but don't go to extremes so that it doesn't either you know, drive people to achieve happiness, like crazy motivation, or, you know, depreciate their psyche to a very bad extent. So homeostasis is a key here. Um, and yeah, it's, it's crazy what's happening with social media um, and, and women on social media, how they're portrayed, you know, if someone's very much out there in the sense that if they're you know, if they're very much comfortable in the bodies and they're showing it like whatever, then men are like, she's a, you know, I, I don't want to say the word, but you get it, you know, um, and uh, whatnot, and how men tend to portray these women. It's it's bad. It's, it's honestly something that I don't think it's going to disappear because it's like in yeah. the culture now, whatever. Um, it's, it's human nature, but just extended digitally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. Um, so I guess moving ahead to our Indian culture. Because <laughs> I don't think a lot of people, uh, like a lot of people in the West side understanding, like I spent good three years of my life living in Israel and they would often like question about like all of these Indian traditions and whatnot, like yeah, arranged marriages, this, that, you know, like, are you going to get married because your parents are forcing you to get, like all of these questions. They oh, have. sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Like what, what's your what's your opinion about like being a high school student? You know, I, I don't know if people ask you these questions and like us growing up, we you know, we often hear all of these things from our parents, grandparents, you know, um, from a conservative way to a more liberal way, you know. Um, I mean it's it, it's it's a it's something to think about, like, you know, what's happening with understanding Indian, Indian culture, but also making the Western or Western people realize how it actually is. So like as a high school student, who's also very intelligent, um, tell me about your opinions on that. Um, well, I didn't have any sort of traditional Indian upbringing, actually, I think. Um, my parents, I think, I think my mother tried to uh, keep Hinduism around in our house and uh, she still tries, uh, but uh, given the drastic change that we had and the amount of work we had to do uh, to get to where we are, uh, it was very hard to um, like be sincerely devoted to religion. I think sincerely devoting yourself to religion is a luxury in itself. Um, and it's hard to do that uh, when you're just trying to put food on the table for your children. Um, so, but my dad, actually, I think he taught it to me best. It's like, uh, religion is how we embrace it in our heart and how we act, uh, less so than something we just show off to other people that, hey, we are religious. Um, I think there is a pretty big thing in, in culture, specifically Hindu culture, um, where uh, it is seen as a virtue to be, you know, um, like showing off how Hindu you are, how much you pray, and like uh, mandir me jana, like going to the mandir. Um, you know, it's, 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 what is it? So it's virtue signaling, um, but in its own way. Um, and uh, like my, I think, I think my family still struggles with that. And that's why I had a hard time taking them seriously. Uh, it was like, you know, do religion for the sake of, hey, I should do religion, but not know sincerely why I should do religion. Um, and that's, I think, largely why they drove me to atheism. And uh, when I was younger, and I have to figure out my own purpose and religion uh, in this sense these days. But uh, when I was younger, uh, I actually didn't grow up with uh, eating like beef or pork. Uh, I don't know if you did, but um, my family is Brahmin. Uh, and so like 
despite that my dad kind of got my mom to try out chicken when we came to America. And uh, I actually grew up eating chicken, which is not typical of Brahmins, but um, maybe I'm not a true Brahmin. Someone cancel me. But uh, uh, we, I didn't grow up eating beef or pork and the kids at school would be like, oh, what are you eating? Like, why don't you eat ham or burgers with us? And I'm like, no, it, I can't eat that. It's, it's not what I'm used to, you know? And uh, they would be like, that's so weird. You never had bacon in your entire life. Are you serious? You never had, you never had ham? Are you really like, wow. And I'd be like, yeah, like I didn't really have it. My mom told me not to. It's just really like, oh, is that part of Indian culture? Like, is that how you speak Indian? Like, I'm like, uh, oh gosh. Um, so uh, it was it was a little bit, I think I had a lot of dissonance, um, but it wasn't something that took a, a big charge of my life. Um, and they would ask like, oh, are you going to get arranged marriage? And I also asked my parents, like I thought they might've gotten arranged marriage and they were like, no, we had a love marriage. So weird, like we have to say love marriage and arrange marriage to distinguish it, but Americans don't do that. <laughs> because we have to outline it like, hello, I fell in love with this person. That's why I married them versus I was arranged to. Uh, it's so funny how we have to distinguish that. <laughs> um, but my parents told me that they did not get uh, arranged married, even though they were kind of like set up and they spent some months dating and you know then they got married. but. Uh, I really don't know what to believe. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think I would get arranged married myself uh, because I'm in a position that is well enough for me to make good choices and I'm surrounded by good people, which eventually one of them will become my husband, whoever it is. Um, we don't know, but someone will. Um, and uh, yeah, I will not get arranged married. Sorry. Oh, no, me, no, me either. Like, geez. <laughs> like, you know, um, the, like, I'm there were maybe worse now. kids. Yeah, here in India, the amount of arranged marriages I've seen doesn't work out. Doesn't work out because like mm -hmm. you're meeting this person you've never met before, and now you're you know married. Have you, and... seen, Indian, have you seen Indian matchmaking? Oh yeah, dude, it happens all the time here. Like you know, and it's crazy. It's it's so crazy. Like even my um, grandmother is very conservative, and so you know, okay. time to time she would say. I'm gonna look for, um, I'm gonna get look for a boy for you even though my parents are like you know you know like you know find a person who you love you know don't don't get into your grandmother's um advice but it's, it's crazy how much that is a part of Indian culture still um like yeah. I would say um the modern Indians are not like that but then they're again you know concert because India is so huge and like there's classes yeah. and whatnot um you know they the this thing still exists um you know for me growing up i've seen all of these arranged marriage like you know you have to go to this marriage you have to go to that marriage i'm just like like geez like why am i here <laughs> um but yeah it's 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 crazy go growing up in india and also with these uh, indian values like you were talking about um ham and pork right <laughs> it's a funny story um uh i don't so my parents are um rajput so, so no um okay. so no uh nothing you know not even eggs um and all that stuff not eggs no onions um okay. garlic and all that stuff you know like very pure vegetarian um and so i grew up like that so of course like when you grow up like that you know you kind of yeah. become hesitant to it although like if i were to go out i can definitely have onions and garlic because like that's uh like this like whatever um but um, this one thing happened when I was in Tel Aviv, um, you know, it was during um, the uh, the bombings and everything back in Tel Aviv, like we were getting rockets and everything. Um, so we were very distressed. Um, and so I went out with my friend, I had a lot of alcohol and um, there was a point where we were too out of it. <laughs> and so my friend goes like, yo, here's a crab. And I was I was like, you know what? let's do it let's let's you know like this is a point where i break my vegetarianism because i was too you know too 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 intoxicated and, and i and i had it and i almost died i'm not even kidding almost died like literally so we went back to her place and um you know and i and i don't have like that much recollection of the entire thing because of the intoxication of alcohol and you know it jumbling with crabs and like gotten yeah even had like ham or pork something like that 
something which I'm not supposed to have literally. And um, yeah, next thing I know, I'm puking. <laughs> um, oh, so wow. I, yeah, because it did not interact. I've never had these, uh, you know, not- no, Your body rejects it. Yeah, and puking and puking and puking. Oh, Probably my unconscious at some point. My, my, you know, friend is going crazy. She's like, you know, like call an ambulance, call an ambulance, you know, she was going absolutely nuts. Next thing I know, I'm on the fr- uh, ground, like, you know, this. Um, shaking and like still like you know like what just happened I have no clue um, the ambulance people are coming thankfully it was you know it was sorted out but you know never gonna try never gonna try um, meet again after that point I'm just like no no yeah. never again um, but yeah it's it's crazy how it interacts with your body um, when you grow up vegetarian um, especially with alcohol uh, not recommended oh. <laughs> not recommended at all um, but yeah uh, crazy growing up in India and having those cultural influences. Um, yeah, I've had talks with my friends about um, arranged marriages and whatnot. You know, another thing I've noticed um, being a university student, you know, in Israel, that they often, you know, have these preconceived notions, right? So if you're Indian, probably coming from a poor country or whatever, so, you know, you might not have that much money, you know, and like, you know, they would subliminally put it there, you know, subliminal uh, racism, whatever. And I'm just like, dude, um, like I at this point, I'm just like, I don't even argue back. It's like, get your education from somewhere. Like, I'm not going to teach you whatever. Um, but yeah, it's crazy what Westerners think about Indian culture in general and how we actively try to explain it to them. And it's still just goes up their mind like that um it's okay unless unless they become uh married into an indian family i think they could care less or other i guess like uh, unless they have uh close indian friends um it doesn't really matter and i think that's fine as long as they're not hurting each other that's okay yeah crazy um i think one last question i would have for you since you're doing like the stanford thing right um since we have narrow deep ai at the moment and people are really trying to get to age you guy um what are your opinions on that like how, how long is it going to be till we reach age because like the moment i look at like narrow dpi it's not that it's not that good um doesn't seem that good doesn't seem that solid but people are still like you know determined to go to age um and then you know how nick bostrom has another esi there which is even more crazier um and i mean that's what they teach in basic artificial intelligence class like Nick Bostrom you know he talks about you know narrow DPI, AGI, guide and ASI um I, I recently did a seminal paper comparing you know the western view of AI versus the eastern view of AI and it was very interesting because like um you know western influence in terms of pop culture and literature often tries to portray that we're going to have some sort of apocalypse um you know that cyborgs then you know they're going to take over the world whatever if you reach like that level of um agisi and then in the west eastern world what i found very interesting was that in japan um due to a very large influence of animism and you know shinto buddhist traditions they live with robots they think that robots have sentience they call it kami um and 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 they have like ceremonial burials for them like it's it's insane how much they are, you know, like how much robots cohabitate with actual Homo sapiens, um, and you know how much they care about robots in general. Um, and so, like, what are your depictions on? I mean, I'm not sure how much um, you know about the Eastern influence, but like, wh- wh- where where do you think we're gonna go with the AGI if we actually ever reach it? And um, is it actually going to be apocalyptic or we're actually going to become cyborgs? Um, I think there's so many different perspectives on how this could go. Um, but I think, I think you know that whole thing about um, like optimists ultimately design and decide the future and pessimists just end up being right, um, right? Uh, I think the AI community needs the optimism of AGI to keep it going uh, in, in pursuit of something and uh, come up with something interesting, whether it is AGI or not. Um, 
I am not certain uh, how HI will come out to be. Sorry, that was such a midwit answer. Um, let me reconsider. Uh, I think that uh, it would be awesome if we had AGI in our lifetime. Um, I just don't know how possible it is to make sand come to life and, make it, and allow machines to think. Although I think we are getting closer and closer um, in a way that makes it seem real, in a way that it copies the style. But I think what really distinguishes humans from machines, no matter how general we're able to create, even from any sort of narrow baseline is, um, uh, computers cannot ask uh, how or why a thing is. Uh, we can. Uh, this is what makes humans different. Uh, humans are, can be creative, uh, while machines cannot ask. They can just do. Um, so we can tell a machine what to think, but not how to think or why to think. Um, so, so in my opinion, um, until we get to a state where, uh, like GB3 or whatever the most powerful AI in existence. Uh, is doing is a beyond just copying the style of human text, uh, but is able to reason. Uh, that is something that I think will be truly groundbreaking for the AGI community and the hype will be, uh, and the motivation and optimism will be for something. Um, but uh, until then, I think we are uh, like making our, our jobs easier and we're creating new jobs and uh, we're making everything efficient and exciting. And uh, the AGI community needs um, Nick Bostrom's super intelligence thesis to uh, write along to make interesting things, no matter where we get. So um, that's that's what I think so far. But I also have a very narrow understanding of super intelligence and AGI. I was just oh, yeah. interested to it uh, like last year. I only heard about AGI like last year, so that's so far. Yeah, no, I I got into this um, artificial human artificial intelligence nexus class in Prague oh. when I was on the semester exchange thing based on scholarship or whatever. Um, and it was very interesting to um, dive into Nick Boston's super intelligence oh. and everything. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, like, I mean, it's probably gonna take years to get to AGI and then way more years to get to ASI. And then if we, it, we cannot stop evolution, that's the thing, right? Like at some point it's probably gonna happen. Depends, you know, how it's gonna roll out. Um, no one knows that, but um, yeah, I think I'm quite optimistic in, in terms of us reaching AGI at some point. Um, and, you know, this yeah. is one thing, you know, we have utopia, then we have dystopia, you know, and people try actively to reach this utopic state. And the thing is, you cannot have utopia. You know, utopia is all good, everything is all good. No, society works on disruption. That's how society works, you know? And if there's total dystopia, then it's like, you know then it's too bad so you know homeostasis has to be there always um and i think that's how society is working and how society will progress um but i don't think we'll ever reach um tech utopia of some sort um you know there's always two forces two polar sites coming in uh going in places um so yeah it's it's uh it's it's a deeper thing to think about most of the times um, especially, you know, with the arguments of transhumanism, cyborgs, whatnot going um, going on now these days. Um, but yeah, do you have any last comments uh, or like anything to um, enlighten people and also tell people where they can find you and everything? Um, I'm mostly on Twitter. Uh, it's at Snigderoy, uh, S-N-I-G-D-R-0-Y. It's not an O. To zero um yeah i i'm mostly there and my website but i need to really change that oh no dude the website is amazing trust me <laughs> i was it's blown a, away it's a childish design uh and i have to i have to sincerely minimize it because i realize that's what the cool kids are doing these days the cool kids <laughs> but uh no your your website is pretty dope honestly like i went through it like three times and like maybe more than that actually because it was just very interesting to me you know the way you've um the way yeah. you have created and crafted it it's pretty pretty brilliant pretty brilliant um so yeah no thanks for coming on um i really sure. think you're very intelligent because you know with this conversation your thoughts are flowing like this and I rarely encounter people who are, you know, very, you know, that their thought, artic uh, thought articulation is, uh, you know, rapid. Because, you know, most of the people are like, hmm, let me think about it. 
and then they go off but you you know you hear it and then you're going off and I really like that um so yeah I hope you reach you know whatever um aims and goals you have in life because I think you're gonna go way ahead way ahead in life um, I'm pretty sure looking at your tra tra trajectory so far um and also again thanks for coming on it's been a pleasure um I feel like we've covered topics that most people don't even talk about at least on podcast um so yeah that was that was really 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 amazing um and yeah I'm actually very happy and enlightened after this conversation I'm like thoughts probably gonna start <laughs> posting on twitter now about the same um so yeah no thank you for coming on it's been a pleasure yeah thank you for having me this was so fun yeah of course and come on whenever you want like you know be an active guest here love that sure sure thanks